Hello guys, Monkey Boy here, and today we're going to be talking about the top five legendary lords that need a rework. So these aren't specifically due to racial reworks. For example, we know that Norska is due for a rework. But these are specific legendary lords who are already in well-established factions who I think need changing slightly. Most of these legendary lords were introduced quite early into the Warhammer 1 and slash beginning of Warhammer 2 life cycle. So they seem a little bit outdated now and just need a little bit of a kick to get them up to date with the rest of Warhammer 3. So that being said, let's get straight into number 5. Coming in at number 5, you've got Lord Skrulk with Clan Pestilence. Now... Clan Pestilence has a little bit of an upgraded version of the Plague mechanic compared to other Legendary Lords, but I still feel like it's not enough. I I just wanted to start with this one for number 5. I think it's the most obvious. A lot of people have been uh, requesting this. A lot of other content creators have talked about this. But he just needs another version of Nurgle's Plague mechanic. But he does have uh, a little bit of a buff. So, for example, at the moment, he has a chance of plague spreading plus 100%. And unique to him, his plagues also bolster his forces and nurture his settlements, actually giving a stat boost to all of his armies and regions. But I think it needs to be a little bit better. Uh, there is a lovely mod on the workshop that actually demonstrates this really nicely. You start off with the original buffs that you would get normally if you were releasing these plagues into the world. But then you've got additional benefits down below, um, which you can add on to the plagues, very similar to Nurgle's plague mechanic. I do think that actually these plagues should be able to spread Nurgle corruption. It does make sense if a disease is spreading throughout the world. It doesn't really matter who's created that disease or where that disease came from. It should be a Nurgle uh, thing and he should start spreading Nurgle corruption. And I think that you should uh, also gain relationships to Nurglish factions, maybe giving yourself an early ally up here if you can take out Itza before this faction dies. I think it'll be quite a nice little thematic thing for Clan Pestilence. But that's kind of it, to be honest. Just give him a nice plague uh, mechanic. Um, he just needs a little bit of a boost because, to be honest, out of the four major clans in Total War Warhammer 3, he's just a little bit basic. He feels very generic and he needs to give that oomph that the other three uh, major clans have. Anyway, that's it for Clan Pestilence. Now let's move on to number four. Coming in at number four, we have Vlad and Isabella von Karstein. Now, in Vlad's lore, his ambition and goal in life is to become the Emperor of the Empire. So, I think it would be very fitting for him to actually have some form of the elect account system, but in a very slight difference to the traditional elect account system that we have over here with Karl Franz and Gelt. I do think that you should be able to, instead of confederate the other elect accounts, but vassalize them. And I think if you were to do something very similar to how the Warriors of Chaos have their Dark Fortresses and they can vassalize the Norskans, I think if you were to go over here and take the, the capital calls. here of the Ostermark uh, Elect account, you should be able to vassalize the other three minor, uh, minor, minor settlements over here. Um, to become part of your empire. So you're not completely destroying the empires. So you don't want to destroy them as Vlad, really, in his law. He just wants to rule them. So I think that you should have this um, to vassalize all of the elect accounts across the entire empire, including Karl Franz himself. If you were to go all the way over to Altdorf, for example, straight away and take it, you should be able to confederate, um, not confederate, sorry, you should be able to vassalize Karl Franz immediately, no matter how strong he is. Um, I do think that you should also gain fealty with these elect accounts over time, uh, but I do think that you need to be vassalized with them for the fealty to increase, and then once that fealty has uh, maxed out at level 10, you should start unlocking the uh, unique items and unique units that those elect accounts would normally gift to Karl Franz, and that will just give you a little bit of a boost and some, some bit of an incentive to actually become the emperor rather than just kill all of the empire um it gives you a slightly unique campaign because i feel like all the vampire counts are very samey in warhammer 3 at the moment the only one that's got some slight difference actually would be um manfred with the books of nagash system 
Uh, but apart from that, everyone is pretty much the exact same. So giving this kind of mechanic to Vlad, I think, would be very fitting for him and give the vampires a much more needed, fresh uh, campaign style to play. Anyway, moving on to number three. Coming in at number three, we have Crone, Helebron. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but out of all of the legendary lords for the Dark Elves, I'm pretty sure that Crone Helebron is the least popular. I think even Rakath is beating Crone at this point. Um, she's very outdated. She needs a little bit of a tweak and a rework. And most of her mechanics just, just don't help her at all. Um, and the main mechanic that she has that's unique to her would be the Death Knight mechanic. So the Death Knight mechanic, you have to sacrifice slaves to be able to fill up this meter to get a quite a powerful buff. Um, and you have to sacrifice quite a lot of slaves, particularly for the early game. 500 slaves is, is quite a lot in the early game. And uh, the buffs you do get, I will be honest, are very good. So you get 20% physical resistance uh, for witch elves, sort, uh, sisters of slaughter, death hags, uh, carnate assassins, and hargoneth executioners. And especially for the hargoneth executioners, being your most elite units, having 20% physical resistance on them is really good. Plus you get the extra 10% uh, plus 10 leadership and plus 6 control for all provinces. So it's really nice. You do get some really nice bonuses. But at the cost of your income, you you will struggle to get early game income with this when you have to sacrifice so many slaves. And if you do not keep this up, you start getting some hefty uh, penalties here. Minus four control, which on legendary difficulty is going to be pretty crazy. And then chaos, undivided corruption, plus two for all provinces. Again, hurting your control even further. Um, and I also want to get onto the Blood Voyage mechanic because that's another part of a mechanic which is supposed to be helpful but at the end of the day is more of a donation to all of the High Elves living on Ulf 1. So every time you activate this you will get a Blood Voyage which will um, be sent. It's an AI controlled army which starts off over here near your capital and then eventually will work its way down and start attacking the High Elves of Ulf 1. Um, it sounds really cool, but because it's not a legendary lord faction, it's it feels more like a rebellion faction. So it probably, I'm not really sure how the auto resolves works, but it feels like a rebellion and it feels like it's taken out very easily. So for example, it will come down here, quite a powerful army. It normally has some really strong troops in there. Uh, they're all unbreakable. But if Alariel was to come up there and wipe it out, it'll probably wipe it out in one battle and then all you do is just give a really large uh, gold donation to the high elves making them more powerful and leveling up alariel and her other legendary lords making her stronger and more of a threat to deal with later on so it doesn't really make sense to be honest you just you might as well just go on diplomacy right here and then just give a large no gift donation to them um, you come. where is it like here and yeah you might as well do that it will actually save the uh it will actually be more beneficial to you because you won't give that xp donation at the same time uh, so to change this, I think, yes, you should still be able to get a Blood Voyage, but I think very similar to the Greenskins War, it should just be attacked to Crone's Behold army. It shouldn't be a full-on war, it shouldn't be to all of the uh, lords in Crone's army, but only for Crone Helebron herself. And then she can build up this army while this is full. So uh, units will be recruited while it's at max. It will maintain at max. So you won't get any new units, but you also won't lose them. And then they can start to take attrition uh, from these sections here. Uh, so actually the buffs and negative traits that you get um, should kind of remain. I do think the cost of this should uh, increase further as you get onto the campaign. So every time you pay for it, it should go up. But I think that it should start at a lower amount, maybe at 50 slaves going to 100 slaves, then 200 slaves and 400 slaves and maybe double every turn. I'm not sure how to balance it properly, but it should increase over time, but start at a lower amount. So it flows nicely with your campaign as you're progressing further. Um, 
yeah, so that's kind of it for Corrin Hellebrorn. Give her a small war mechanic attached to her army and change this very slightly. Um, but it just needs to be updated a little bit. I just feel like it's a little bit lacking. Anyway, moving on to number two. I'll Coming in at number two, you have the other side of the Queen and the Crone DLC, which is Alariel. Now, Alariel's campaign is definitely a lot more popular than Hellebron's and a lot more powerful. And I think Welcome. that's due to the Sister of Avalon spam that you can do as she buffs them up to Oblivion and makes them a real powerhouse. But I want to be talking about her mechanic, which is the Defender of Ulthorn mechanic. And I do like it as a mechanic, but I think it needs to be improved on a little bit more as it seems a little bit outdated. And to be honest, it's a little bit easy and once you've completed the Defender of Ulth 1, you can just steamroll and forget about the mechanic completely. But I think it needs to be something that's always on the back of your mind when playing Alariel, as she is meant to be the Defender of Ulth 1. So, um, I want to introduce something from the Wood Elves, which would be the Incursion mechanic. While playing the Wood Elves, there is an event that happens where there is an incursion at the Vale, and it raises the Vale, allowing the Wood Elves to teleport and take the Vale for themselves, so they can start upgrading the forest health and then uh, do the ritual of rebirth. Um, just, just giving you another uh, forest. But I think the, these incursions should be adopted by Alariel as well. So there are two tiers to the Defender of Ulth 1. There, are, there is the inner circle and then there is the outer circle. So for example, right now, the inner circle is now being breached. Uh, that's Lord due to the these Black Dark Elf Lord. factions here and here occupying the inner circle now if the if the inner circle is being occupied by non high elf factions you should start having incursions that happen around the inner circle once you've maximized the inner circle and it's completed by the high elves this should then go to the outer circle where you should start getting incursions and then when this is completely full and completely defended you will get incursions that start off in the ocean and then they will start attacking Ulf one being at war with including Tyrion and Altharion so they will also be able to help you defend against these incursions um, but I think it just gives a little bit of a challenge to Alariel and actually makes it a little bit more thematic. As you've also got the uh, Mortal World Torment, which when Chaos gets stronger, um, more debuffs uh, will happen to Alariel and buffs will happen to Chaos, making them stronger and making you weaker. Uh, I do think that these incursions should mainly be Chaos. It should be a combination of Slaneshi, uh, Dark Elves and Warriors of Chaos factions and this will also give a chance for Nikari to respawn and start causing more havoc on the island of Ulf 1 uh, as he does respawn quite often in the lore and attacks Ulf 1 pretty regularly to be honest. Anyway that's going to be enough for Alariel. Let's move on to number one. Now finally coming in at number one we have Oxyodl. Now Oxyodl's campaign is quite fun to be honest at the beginning of the campaign but it becomes very stale very quickly and that is due to the visions of the old one mechanic and the problem that I have with this mechanic is that in theory it does feel really cool it should feel very XCOM where you have to make very difficult decisions but the problem is they aren't difficult decisions and it doesn't really go anywhere it's just constantly repeating the same same thing over and over again and it just never ends and i feel like it just needs to build up to something big at the end and i think that will come with some form of chaos invasion like an end times event or an end game event whatever you want to call it and i think there needs to be a meter up here that builds up over the course of the campaign and you have to either slow that down or reduce the strength of it somehow before the invasion actually occurs. This will mean that once this has been activated, your goal at that point will be to stop the invasion. And once you have stopped the invasion, then the visions of the old one will be complete and you don't need to worry about the mechanic anymore. And then you can just go around conquering the rest of the world as you please. I do also think that the visions should be a lot more impactful as well, uh, especially towards the... Um, the chaos invasion that's going to happen so for example there could be missions i think they will need to be much uh smaller duration so for example this one here is 20 turns i know that's not normal i think the normal amount will be about four to six turns 
but I think they should be reduced to maybe two or three turns, so some of them are going to fail. You will not be able to complete all of these tasks. So, for example, there should be some tasks around here. Let's say that Scarbrand is over here and Kugath is over here. And you have an option to stop one of these factions becoming part of the end times. And you need to decide, do you want Nurgle to be out of the end times or do you want uh, Korn to be out of the end times? And you will have to choose which one you will have to face later on as an end times faction. Um, so I think they need to be a lot more impactful. And maybe you can do that with a lot of things. Maybe if you do not complete a certain task, then all Nurgle units will gain regen regeneration during their end times. Or all Corn units will gain the, um, the Blood Feast mechanic or the Blood Gorge uh, mechanic where they can regenerate when they're in combat. You know, they should be a lot more impactful and it should be building up towards this end time event. And I think it will make it a lot more climactic um, of a finish. And then you just don't have to worry about the visions of the old one later on while you go around and progress through the rest of your campaign. And it'll give you something to work for. And I feel like you're actually doing something with this. Because at the moment it just feels it just feels something you have to do so you don't get some annoying negative traits. But let's be honest, if uh, Nikari gets plus 10 melee attack for his army um, and his army only that's not going to affect your campaign that's not that's not going to do anything for you because he's, he's so far away so yeah, I just feel like a lot of it is just a bit it's just a bit crap and you just need to rework it and have some sort of goal that the warriors of chaos or chaos in general are working towards and you need to slow them down and weaken them before they trigger the end times event so these are my top five legendary lords that I think need a rework. What do you guys think? Do you think there are other legendary lords that need reworks more than these guys? Do you like my changes that I suggested? Um, do you not like them? Please let me know in the comment section down below. Uh, but until then, guys, thank you very much for watching. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. And I'll see you all in the next one. Bye for now.